Hello, everybody. Welcome to the American Sleep Apnea Association's Philips Recall Webinar. My name is Justine Amder. I'm a longtime member of the Sleep Apnea Association, and the ASAA is a patient-led advocacy group for those individuals that have sleep apnea. Today, we are going to speak to sleep apnea patients whose Philips CPAP machines were recalled. In late September, these individuals represented the ASAA at a closed-door Food and Drug Administration FDA recall hearing. We'll be listening to their recall stories and their experiences with the FDA. Let's wave hello, Jenny Shields, Alice Rowling, Josh Lawton, uh, and Nathan Relkin. Thank you for joining us this evening. And later in the program, Jules Friedman, our executive director at the ASAA, will report on behind the scenes activities that we're undertaking uh, regarding the Phillips recall. Uh, he's going to update on some of the new challenges and the, uh, that the recall process faces. Um, so let's just talk for a quick second about the recall. Um, Phillips states that since their June 20. 21 FDA announcement, 3.4 million CPAP machines have been registered on their recall uh, website. That means that 3.4 million patients had to make serious decisions on whether or not to continue to use their CPAP therapy and their treatment for their sleep apnea. Um, to put it simply, Phillips describes the problem as the deterioration of the insulating foam that dampens the motor's noise on the CPAP machine. The FDA considered this um, to pose a class one health hazard to patients. That's the most serious possible hazard to a patient. The foam might release toxic gases or it might break off in tiny bits. Each of our guests here today had to as assess those risks for themselves and decide what they were going to do. Before we start talking about the FDA hearing, let's meet the individuals that are here today, hear a little bit about their stories and what's happened to them since the recall. Let's start with the ladies here, please. Uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you live in the country, and most importantly, has your Philips machine been replaced? Let's kick it off with Jenny. Hi, I'm Jenny Shields. I'm in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and no, I've heard nothing back from Phillips about replacing my CPAP. Alice, how about you? You're muted, oh, Alice, Alice. you're on mute. <laughs> it's okay, go Sorry. ahead. Sorry, okay. Um, hi, I'm Alice Rowling, and I live in a small town in southwest Minnesota. Uh, my uh, CPAP machine has been uh, replaced. Great, good for you. Let's let's meet these two gentlemen. Tell us where you live in the country and if your machine has been replaced. Josh. Hey everybody, I'm Josh Lawson from Columbus, Georgia, and so far my machine has not been replaced. And Nathan. I'm Nathan Rilkin from Lehigh, Utah, and my machine has not been replaced. Okay, so we're one out of four here on replacements uh, this evening. Um, let's start off with, uh, with Nathan and then Josh. How important is uh, using your CPAP machine to you? Nathan, you kick it off and then Josh will go. Sure, my, uh, using my CPAP is critical. Uh, to me, I was losing my memory. I was having a number of other health issues uh, when I found out and started using a CPAP. Uh, my life changed. It really changed my quality of life. And now without having a machine, I'm having issues with seizures and things have deteriorated significantly. And so to me, it's a huge difference in quality of life. Wow. Wow. And you, Josh? I was diagnosed with central sleep apnea back in 2014 um, when I was 29 years old. And I was prescribed a uh, uh, affected uh, BiPAP machine, and I used it nearly every day until uh, the beginning of this year, when because of the five-year replacement cycle, I was a year past due and replaced mine. Um, so for six years, I was using the affected machine, and you know I can't imagine what it would be like. To go without my machine because um, my AHI was 105 
Now it's under two. And I can tell a substantial difference between when I use my machine and those few days when I don't. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the um, symptoms that anyone experienced with, you know, using their Philips uh, machine with this recall. Um, Jenny, did you have any symptoms that you experienced? Uh, did you have any little bits of those uh, debris that they were talking about in your tank? I did not have uh, bits of debris in my tank, but what I did notice is that I had discolored phlegm. I started getting black phlegm, um, which is pretty unusual and, and pretty concerning. Um, and could not figure out what was going on with my lungs that I would be producing um, discolored phlegm and then realize that it has something to do with the CPAP recall. Yeah. Alice, what about you? Um, I was experiencing um, a lot of respiratory issues, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, easily winded, headaches, itchy skin. Um, I also started having some heart issues where um, it just racing heart, uh, my, the way that my heart was beating was um, not what it should be doing. I ended up having to stay a few days in the hospital because of uh, some inflamed organs. So it was, I, I didn't know at the time uh, what was going on. It was just, um, it was pretty scary. And yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it is when you don't when you don't know what's going on. Nathan, you experienced uh, some symptoms as well, correct? Yes. Uh, first couple of years I had the machine, I think I was doing great. Didn't have I was adjusted to it well, but then I started getting headaches seemingly for no reason, and I started feeling <clears throat> just a little more nasal congestion and other issues. That again, on regular use of the machine, it seemed okay, but then it just seemed to get worse over time, and I just didn't know why. Right. Josh, anything with you? Any bits in your tank or anything that you noticed about your machine? Not that I can read readily recall, because if there were any, I chalked it up to maybe it was just debris that, you know, may have gotten in my mask while, you know, during the daytime when I wasn't wearing it. But um, no, I can't readily recall. You know, I just um, I just realized I, I wanted to tell our audience here that we are going to have a Q&A towards the end of the video. So please make sure to type your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom um, application. Uh, you're welcome to chat with everybody and all the participants there in the chat function. But if you have some questions that you want to ask the ASAA, the panelists here, um, our executive director, it's best to put them in the Q&A and then we'll focus on them towards the end. Of, uh, of the video. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so getting back to just a little bit more background information. Um, uh, Jenny, who did you contact about the, about the recall when you found out about it? Did your DME, insurance, doctors, what, what happened? Did they uh, say all of the above. Um, first, when I found out from a friend, because I heard nothing from Phillips, um, I contacted my DME and their first response to me was to hang up in my ear. I called them back and they tried to claim that I was no longer in their jurisdiction. Although two weeks before they tried to sell me CPAP, uh, CPAP supply. So I, I was in their jurisdiction two weeks before I tried to find out about the recall. Um, I called my, my, my primary care physician. She knew nothing about the recall. Um, and then um, you know, she finally found information that I sent her about it. And uh, it was just a frustrating experience all around. Yeah. Alice, what about you? Who did you contact and, and what happened there? Um, I totally relate with what Jenny just said. I, I did the same steps. Um, the DME, when I, I was concerned when I contacted my DME because they really downplayed the, the whole recall and Knowing what I'd already read and and knew about the recall, I I was surprised that I, I really um, didn't get anything from them, and um, I, I kept going back trying to get um, them to understand because I was renting my machine, so I was thinking this would be a rather easy um, replacement kind of situation, and that was not uh, the experience that I had at all. 
And knowing um, I, I had the opportunity to work for the ASAA. So I know what, um, you know, basically what I was hearing about the recall and how important it was to us getting these replaced. So I kind of kept going back and pushing a little bit harder to try to get um, the, the escalated uh, response from my DME. And I finally, um, the DME that I go through is affiliated with a large hospital. And so I was like, I need to talk to the supervisor. I need to take this further because I had went out and got um, paid out of my pocket to get my machine replaced. But knowing what I hear every day it was more than just what I was going through. It was we need to get um, some attention to this, this uh, recall so that we can start getting um, a successful process in place and get, get the machines to the people that, that need them. So I kept pushing on. I finally did hear back from the supervisor. Uh, we had a conversation. Um, at first it was, well, we stopped charging the rent. Um, so you're not paying the rent, so don't need to worry about that. Um, and, you know, I kept going, but that's not my concern. It was, you, I had this machine, I got through you, you need to help. And um, I started, you know, I, I don't know if it is because I work for the ASAA or what, but I did get, by the end of the conversation, she said, we'll replace your, your machine, we'll be reaching out to you. And so I was very fortunate and, and I do understand that. Yeah. Um, getting, yeah. getting that replaced. Um, Did anybody here use um, any of the ozone or UV cleaning machines? Maybe raise your hand, I call on you or with their machines. No, no one was using those. Okay, okay. Um, I, mm -hmm. Are you oh, work? Sorry, I, yes. I did use um, the so clean. Um, I, as soon as I um, got word about the danger of it, I did quit. Both my husband and I were using it. Um, but I had a hard time because my DME right next to the machine that I got was a so clean machine. Right. And um, so it was, um, it was a little bit confusing um, that they're dangerous yet I can get one in the same place. So Yes, that was very, I understand that, yeah. Um, Josh, why don't you talk for a minute about uh, how you felt the Phillips recall registration was? Was it a smooth process? Was it easy to get information and use the, use the website and figure it out? No, absolutely not. And I speak to that as both an affected patient as well as a professional web developer. I've developed websites for Fortune 500 companies, and I know what it's like to build these sort of mission critical um, workflows. And speaking as somebody who builds these kind of sites, I can say that you know it's incredibly not user friendly. Um, it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of accessibility, in how the the form is laid out and the kind of data that's needed to um, uh, be entered is, um, is very cumbersome. And, you know, there's no way to create a profile, let's say, so that if you have more than one machine, you can um, see what the status is and uh, get your confirmation number if you, if you may need it. Um, the website is not updated with any regularity, and it's very difficult to, to find um, uh, the sort of information that patients like us would want to have. Does anyone here use the, the Philips um, app for the CPAP machine, Dream Mapper? Did you get any notices on there? Nathan, yes. So I actually do have the app, uh, at which I could follow to track how I was doing. Uh, the only thing I got was uh, outage alerts. You know, hey, the system's kind of down or whatever. I didn't get anything related to the recall at all. Yeah. I do I didn't use, go ahead. Go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, I do use the app and um, I did get a notice, but it was buried in the file section, which is usually... Uh, where they try to sell you different equipment, you would have to 
physically go there to see it. It was nothing that came across um, in my daily use. Alice, were you going to say something? Um, yep. Okay, great. Yep. Well, um, let's move on to talk about the FDA hearing that the four of you participated in. Um, your variety of experiences that you're talking about here made you ideal uh, panelists and patients for this FDA hearing. Uh, the meeting was held on Zoom on September 29th. Um, a 2021. And um, I'm going to kick off my questions about the hearing to, to Jenny first, um, because this was not your first time talking to Washington, D.C. agency. You do this professionally in some other areas. Can you kind of paint a picture for us? And, and how would you describe this FTA meeting that, that the ASA had and you participated in? Was it like other ones that you've been to? What was the tone? Well, I can say that I've had staff testify on the Hill many times. And for me, this one was kind of odd because they seem to be more focused or more concerned about the content of the website as to, as to what was on the website. Was it clear? Were you able to navigate the website as opposed to what our concerns were and our concerns about our health and about notification? So I, I found that to be uh, very baffling and very concerning. Yeah. Um, Nathan, what did the FDA want to know from you? What kind of questions did, did they ask you? So they did ask about our condition a little bit in terms of trying to understand what we were coming with, comorbidities and things like that. Um, but, but again, at that point after that, I feel like I didn't get much additional information about the process or what remediations would happen or who I could go to in the future for information. Uh, that was still left out uh, to be answered later, I guess. Yeah, okay. Alice, you mentioned earlier that uh, you work with the ASAA, so you have a lot of patient um, contact. Um, were you able to tell the FTA um, about how it's uh, affecting the people that you talk to in their day-to-day -day lives? Did you share any patient stories? Um, I, that was one of the main things that I thought was the single most important thing for me to, to get across that day is that I've I feel that this recall and what all the patients are faced with is life and death. I, I felt that it could be summed up just that, that um, statement and, and how important it was. Um, it's affecting millions of people. Um, they're put in a very dangerous, uncertain and frustrating position every day. Um, they have to um, decide, make that decision um, when they go to bed each night to use their machine or not use their machine. Um, I got, you know, the, I got to kind of speak in generalities. Um, if I had a chance to talk with them again, one of the things I, I would love to tell them about a story of a, um, a conversation that I had with, um, she's a 70-ish a um, aged woman and she, um, her name is Nancy. She has COPD and OSA. Uh, she had to be without her machine for months because of the recall and not getting any response. Um, she very, trying to go to Phillips and to get the answers. She's tried to go through her DME. She tried to go through her insurance and she just kept getting roadblocks. Um, and she uh, tried to get the machine replaced. Her insurance, she couldn't afford the copay. So she couldn't go through that way. And, um, she just was not getting any answers and the fear and um, the, the listening to her having to fight this on her own and, and, and just hitting the roadblocks. I wanted to try, I would have loved to have brought that story and try to make this, this is about real people. This is lives every day that, um, that are affected. And that's what I wish I could have had a little bit more time to share with them some yeah. real life. Okay. Things. Yeah. Yeah. It's very time consuming. We all know as a, as a patient, when you're trying to get information or questions answered, it's, it, it's a, it becomes a full-time job in and of itself just to, to work through some of those hurdles. Um, Nathan, do you think that the FDA absorbed the information that you 
we're giving them with, with their other colleagues here? Do you, do you think they heard what you had to say? Yeah, you know, that's tough because I, I feel like, you know, they were listening, they were asking questions. Um, but I think that the difference between listening and taking action is where I, I just feel like I haven't still really seen anything or heard anything. And, and so that, that's where I feel like maybe they were listening, but I just don't know that there's been action. And, and for me, as I, go, as I go through the same experience that she mentioned before, I've, I submitted mine, I followed up with Phillips, you know, they've passed me along to different places, but I've come back to Phillips again, they've escalated my case, no matter what, I just still have no, no resort for action. And that's where I wish the FDA or others would step in and say, here's action we plan to take to try to address this issue. Yeah, yeah. Josh, um... What would you have liked the FDA to ask? What do you think is one of the big things that maybe they missed by having having this patient panel there? One of the things that I wish they would have addressed is some of the regulatory impediments that make it more difficult for them to be as responsive as we would prefer. Um, you know, I'm in the IT business, not the government uh, you know, uh, the governance business, right? So it's, it's very difficult for me to understand what limitations exist uh, that are uh, applied to the, uh, imposed upon the FDA uh, due to various laws and regulations. So having some more clarity about that would help level set expectations about what they can and cannot do, but also um, as a concerned citizen, you know, that, uh, that gives us, you know, policy ideas that, you know, we here with the American Sleep Apnea Association can address um, or, you know, start a campaign, you know, a letter writing campaign or something to um, let our politicians know that, you know, there are things that could be done at the congressional level to help make FDA more responsive to us, the healthcare consumers, and the patients affected by not only this recall, but future recalls. Right, right. Like we said before, 3.4 million people are having a problem. That's, you know, that's a lot. Um, Jenny, let me have you wrap it up here. I mean, Alice talked about, you know, what she wished that um, she would have been able to say about a story and, you know, when she was there in front of the FDA. Now that you, you know, have had a couple of months to step back, is there something that you, you know, wish that you would have been able to say while you were there that you thought a little bit about afterwards? Um, all I can say is that when my Honda was recalled, I got a notification from Honda. When I went to get an oil change, I got a notification from uh, my, my dealer. I get notifications about my car, but I can't get any notifications about my CPAP, which is a life or death situation for me. I use my CPAP because I have AFib, meaning my heart was stopping. It wasn't, it was an ir irregular heartbeat. Um, and it was keeping my heart regular. I want my heart to beat like it's supposed to be. Um, I should not be running around trying to get information um, about equipment that's vital to my health and well-being. Um, I found the website difficult to navigate in terms of Phillips. I haven't heard anything from them. Like I said, the notice that I got from them came on August 11th, which was a month after the recall and after I'd already registered my um my, my, my equipment, it's just ridiculous to me that there isn't a system to adequately notify people that a vital piece of medical equipment is, not, is, is, is deadly and, and not working properly. So that's yeah. my concern. Well, um, I was at the first meeting the ASA ho held with the FDA back in 2018. It was um, a little bit of a different setup. It was a more get to know you, let's collect some information from patients type of meeting. Um, and it was the first time the FDA ever spoke directly to uh, sleep apnea patients to hear about their experience with getting diagnosed treatments and, and, and care. Um, and, uh, you know, just like you guys, the uh, panelists were very focused 
focused on finding successful solutions for themselves and our community at large. So I want to thank you all for, for your time and your effort in, in speaking to them and on our behalf. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Gilles in just a minute. Um, but I want to talk just uh, for a few moments about some quick updates with the ASAA. Um, we've been working really hard to try to deal with this recall uh, situation and provide service to um, not only our uh, Phillips uh, patients, but also all of our patients um, that are in our community. And um, we have been working on four types of initiatives um, in regards to the recall. The first is a nationwide survey. This survey was emailed out on November 4th to our community at large. And so if you haven't completed the survey, please check your email boxes and go ahead and, um, and get that done. You are free to also forward the survey to family, friends, or anybody else that you know that's been affected with um, the, the Phillips um, recall. Uh, we will go ahead and send another email out about that same survey, um, but we really want to get that information to the FDA um, uh, in regards specifically to the recall. Um, we are also working with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine on a second survey uh, that is also about the CPAP uh, recall. Um, I know it seems like a lot of surveys, but they're different organizations, different groups. And so, you know, we're trying to keep them as short as possible. So please go ahead when you get those emails, uh, take, take 10, 10 minutes to fill out those surveys for us. Um, the ASA is working with the transportation industry, uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine again, and other interest groups to put pressure on the Biden administration to invoke the Presidential Defense Production Act. Um, and if that were to be authorized, it would step up production of new safe CPAP machines here in the U.S., which, um, you know, 3.4 million people are looking for right now. As you may also know, uh, as being in the American sleep apnea community, uh, we have our CPAP assistance program. That program has long helped individuals that um, either have high deductibles or no insurance, can't afford a CPAP machine or supplies. A lot of the machines that the association has received in the past came from manufacturers. Obviously, that has stopped at this point. Um, so the um, association has decided to relax some of the um, uh, 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 donation aspects of the machine for us to receive. We usually um, have a 5,000 hour limit on those machines and we have increased that because there is such a need with the recall for people to have um, uh, machines. So we ask that you take a look at this program if you're not familiar with it on our website. Um, and if you have an unwanted, lightly used machine in your possession, please consider donating it to us so we can get it in the hands of someone that needs the machine. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring Jill's into this part of our discussion. The ASA, as I said before, has been spearheading some solutions and policy changes in regards to the recall. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about some behind the scenes activities. And so welcome, Jill's Friedman, the executive director of the ASA. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for listening to this uh, webinar. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. You're good. So go ahead and talk about some of the areas that the um, that the ASA is working on. So, uh, as everybody has heard, it's very difficult to get a replacement machines. One of the things we are trying to do. Uh, we have been in discussion with a company that created a BiPAP machine for COVID and received from the FDA an emergency use authorization for that device as a ventilator, basically for COVID patients that are either at home or in a hospital setting. And we are, if we are successful, we will receive at least a thousand of those devices that we can then like help a thousand people that have a Philips recalled machine before they received a replacement from Philips. One thing that has, was, that has not been mentioned is that Philips says it may take uh, up to a year or at least a year before they can replace all the machines. So if we are successful in getting some uh, positive advice from the FDA 
to use these devices uh, under a different emergency use authorization for the period when people have, uh, need to have a replacement for their recalled machine will help at least a thousand people. We are the only association of uh, advocacy organization that like really carries the voice of patients with sleep apnea and it's pretty difficult. Um, one thing that needs to be mentioned because it has not been covered and I'll come back to the reason why after. Uh, Philip's stated policy public, publicly is to replace machines that are currently in use. But Philip's CEO in a talk with financial analysts reporting the third quarter's results said something really interesting. Uh, let me quote him specifically. On the sleep register units, we are currently at 3.3 million registers devices. That does not mean that all registered devices are qualified devices for repair and replace, right? Because we basically, after they are registered, need to make a determination whether they actually have been in use, in use or whether they have been just taken out of the cupboard and put on the registration list, but are not in active use. This is something that he, that has been communicated only to financial analysts and I, from what my understanding is, not even to the FDA. I was, uh, I made absolutely sure that the FDA became aware of this issue because we have no idea how many of those 3.4 million registered devices are not going to be replaced for whatever reason, Philips decide not to replace them. Uh, and as we have heard a few times, the website for registration is one of the least user-friendly website that anybody can find. And one of the big issues is that when you go there, you enter, they ask the website asks you to enter the serial number of the device and then gives you a registration number. It doesn't say anything on the website that you need to um, write down this registration number because it's the only way you can communicate back with Philips to ask them any question. And if you don't write this number and you go back to the Philips website to try to figure it out and you enter again your serial number, the only feedback you get from the website is this device has already been registered. It doesn't give you the number. It doesn't tell you anything. It just leaves you on your own. It turns out that through some, uh, from a conversation that are taking place on Facebook groups, I figured out the only way you can do this. When you make, when you register your device, a company hired by Philips sends you an email. So you will never receive an email from Philips, but you do receive an email from a company called Sedwick, S-E-D-W-I-C-K. And the, in that email, there is the registration number for your C5 device that has been recalled. Uh, and finally, uh, something really that needs to be mentioned. In Australia, you can buy a CPAP device without any prescription, even though they said that it's better if you have a prescription, but it's absolutely not a requirement. You can just go, uh, you park your car, you go to a ResMed store where you can buy or lease the device and then you're good to go. In other words, the CPAP in Australia is a consumer product and you can be sure that ResMed pays very close attention to the consumer's opinion and feedback. In the US, the CPAPs are available only by prescription. And so for the manufacturer, the opinion of those who prescribe and sell the product is the most important together with the financial analyst. It explains, at least in part, why Philips communication about the recall is absolutely catastrophic. There's been a completely lack of patient centricity in anything they have communicated. And if Philips just had, before the recall, brought in a panel of informed patients to look into what they should do with their app, how they should communicate it with the recall, they would have avoided the nightmare that they have now. Yep. That's something we often talk about here at the ASA is the patient involvement. 
you know, with, with, with doctors, manufacturers, research, um, for, yeah, 100% for sure. Yes. Um, uh, I, I forgot to mention one thing because it's, I think it's important. Uh, the Philips website says to stop using your machine. It turns out that the V administration is probably the biggest uh, provider of Philips machine. More than 600,000 veterans have received a Philips Dream Station 1 machine. And the advice on the uh, V administration website is different. It tells the veterans to keep on using the device unless their doctor tells them the other contrary. So it's that's, like that's easy to decipher. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's very confusing right now. I mean, as we've heard from these, you know, four patients and everybody in the chat that's going on online, um, you know, everybody is getting uh, uh, at their wits end on trying to figure out exactly what to do and how to get some help that they need. So, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I heard the frustration of uh, all the people that were on this panel with the FDA, but we have to remember uh the FDA is not used to have patients talking about devices because all the devices are by prescription. And so just as happens with Philips, the FDA usually speaks only with providers and people who prescribe devices. And so having a, uh, bringing a panel of patients is kind of a new uh, activity for the FDA. And we should really encourage them to keep on doing it and to let them know how they can do it better. Uh, I, I'm really excited that they keep on having conversation with us because once again, we are the only association that speaks specifically about the needs of sleep apnea patients. And as you know, Justin, from 2018, in 2018, the FDA knew very little about what it is to be a sleep apnea patient. Correct. So the fact that just three years later, they invite us to be like, real partners and collaborate with them to try to ameliorate the situation of this recall and understand how they can do recalls better next time. I think it's pretty exciting, even though I understand the, completely understand the frustration. Yeah. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you for that information. Um, so now we're going to move more into the, the Q&A part here. Uh, we definitely have some questions in the chat, but first I want to offer uh, an opportunity to our panelists here to ask one another a question or to ask something uh, to Gilles in regards to the ASA. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or, or just wave and we'll call on you. <laughs> Anyone here? If we don't have any, we can move uh, right. Oh, yeah, Josh has one. I think it's important for uh, uh, folks on the webinar to know that it was the American Sleep Apnea Association that I first heard about the recall in the first place. And so I want to express my gratitude to Jill and the rest of the team for, you know, being on top of this. And, and, you know, being, you know, so proactive and, and helping us, you know, understand, you know, what's going on, you know, like, you know, in my case, like six years after, <laughs> you know, I bought that machine. So, so Jill, your, your, your leadership is, is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, we're everybody here at the ASAA, uh, as I said before, it is a patient led uh, nonprofit organization. So um, I didn't mention before that Jill's is a patient. I'm a patient. Alice is here. Is it? Yeah, she is. We, yeah, we, we all are. We understand everything that our community is going through um, from the be, you know, getting diagnosed, figuring out that you need to get diagnosed, getting diagnosed and the all the way through to, you know, sticking with the uh, therapy of choice that, that you're using. And then, a you know, critical situation just like this. Um, I'm going to ask our technical producer, uh, Hunter, to take a look at some of those questions in the Q&A and toss them out to us. So whenever you're ready, Hunter. Hi, Justine. Our first question is from Bob. He says, I work with truck drivers. Truck drivers with OSA must be on CPAP or they lose their DOT medical card and are laid off work. Currently with the recall, there's a shortage of CPAP for any patients. What's going on with 
truck drivers and needing to keep their licenses. Jills, can I give that one to you? Um, can you speak a little bit more? I mentioned before that the ASA is working with the transportation industry and uh, the um, Academy of Sleep Medicine, um, you know, on, uh, can, you, can you add a few comments to that? Well, Bob's question is really important, or the question and comment is really important. Truckers uh, have uh, a very large number of truckers suffer from sleep apnea, and it's fundamental for them to be able to have access to a machine. Without access to that machine, they, uh, they put their life and the life of many others at risk every day. So this is the reason why the first entity that, uh, with whom we talked about the, uh, uh, asking the Biden administration to start the, uh, the production, uh, the Defense Production Act for CPAP machine and, uh, and the various parts of the machines that need to be created now in the US is, uh, was with truckers. The truckers understand exactly the severity of the problem and the urgency of the problem. Oh, and yes. Then the next question we have is a pretty common one. Uh, this is to the panel. Are any of you still using your recalled machine? Nathan? No, you're not using it? I'm not. I should have raised my hand with the thing, but no, I am not using it. Sorry. Okay. And something that's kind of continuing on with that question, did any of you panelists consider dental devices or other alternatives while you're waiting on your recalled machine? Josh, you have your, your hand raised? Yes, um, I was in a interesting, the timing of, of my getting a new BiPAP had nothing to do directly because of the recall. However, I was going to use the the affected BiPAP as my travel BiPAP, um, the one that's always packed, ready to go. Um, so I don't have to, you know, you know, take it apart, put it back together, you know, um, and so on. Um, but because of the recall, uh, I, I've completely stopped using it. And, you know, when my mom was diagnosed with moderate OSA, um, if it were a safe device, I'd let my mom use it, but, but I'm not going to let her, you know, be at risk of developing cancer or something. So, uh, no, I've completely discontinued the, the use of my machine. And another question from one second, Hunter Gilles. Yes. Uh, on top of it, Josh suffer from central sleep apnea and uh, a dental appliance is not the proper uh, instrument to resolve the kind of sleep apnea that he has. I just also wanted to say that I stopped using my CPAP machine and as a result, I had to start going back to the cardiologist to check again for AFib. Um, so now I'm back in jeopardy of, of, of having a repeat heart condition. Um, I have to decide whether or not to use the CPAP that could help, could hurt my health or <laughs> use it and hurt my heart. So it's, it's just crazy. Yes, Jules. Justine, just, just let me say, uh, it's important to know that the American Heart Association put out a scientific paper a couple of months ago, in which it says specifically that 85% of people with AFib also have sleep apnea. So this is really, really important. If you have AFib, there is a tremendous chance that you suffer also from sleep apnea. And in many cases, it's not treated. Go ahead, next, Hunter. Yeah, the next question we have is from a couple of different people. Uh, is anyone getting replacement machines or has Phillips put out any guidance as to when those replacements will start going out? Well, the only uh, part, uh, I was just going to say do. quickly, so, the only, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 go, go. I was just going to say really quickly that of the four individuals here, Alice is the only one that was able to get her, her machine um, replaced. And then I'll go ahead and let uh, Gilles take it from there. So they have uh, 
so Philips has started, I think in early September, started to send the new machines, basically Dream Station 2s. Uh, right at the beginning, I think until now, it's almost the replacements are essentially new machines. And the CEO of the company has said that as they start to receive back a recalled machine, there is a whole repair mechanism that has been approved by the FDA. And it's going to be a mix between what people will receive is a mix between new Dream Stations 2 and repaired DS1. Uh, I also know that many people who have a recall machine and have received a new one are never going to send it back to Philips for a variety of reasons, including legal ones. This next question we have, Justine, is from an anonymous attendee. Is there any chance of having a class action lawsuit? And is our organization in a position to update its members that a class action lawsuit has been initiated? So there are at least 100 class action lawsuits that are already in place. In fact, there are so many class action lawsuits that they are now going to be all uh, held under one jurisdiction even though the class actions are like started across the country. And uh, that's basically the only thing that we, that I know and that we can say about it. Josh, you had something to add? Yes, I have. Um, I was involved in a car collision earlier this year. So I, I have an established uh, relationship uh, or, or retained counsel, um, a personal injury attorney uh, as a result. And when I heard about the class action lawsuits that were starting up, I sent him the information to see about um, uh, starting you know, uh, a class action lawsuit here in my district. Um, you know, because I feel so strongly about it, especially since um, Columbus, Georgia is adjacent to Fort Benning. So we have a very sizable veteran population in this area, um, such as my stepfather, who's also affected by this recall. Hunter? The next question from another anonymous attendee is, has Philips been contacted by the ASAA about this issue for solutions? Jills, can you answer that question? Has yes. Philips been in touch uh, with you? Very early on, we let uh, Philips know that um, quite a few people who received machine from our CAT program had uh, recalled machines. And we never heard back from uh, another word from Philips. I had one call right at the beginning and uh, never received any kind of feedback. And I think this is the last one we have time for. We have a question from Kevin. Are there any other CPAP manufacturers that have discovered any flaws? Not that we know of. Uh, the other manufacturers are using totally different kind of foam. And it looks like uh, the different kinds of foam are not, do not have at all the same problem, even though uh, the biggest manufacturer, ResMed, has put on its website a warning already more than two years ago, saying that any use of an ozone cleaning machine would void the warranty on your CPAP machine. So it's a, the, the problem of the ozone cleaner is, uh, is very real. And uh, I would say, once again, it's, to me, it is very strange that the FDA regulates the CPAP machines, but does not regulate the cleaning machine that cleaned the CPAP device. And now we see the result. Well, thank you, audience, for, for all of those questions. And um, thank you to the, the panelists here for taking the time to, to, to field those. Um, I just want to make sure everybody knows that this um, video and webinar, Unmask and Afraid, Philip's Recall Update, uh, will be available on our website and YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So if you feel that you have a family or friend or a coworker that could benefit from some of the information that was given here today, please go ahead and uh, make sure that they get that link so that they can, they can watch that. Um, 
throughout this uh, discussion today, we've been telling you how the ASAA works for you as a patient advocacy group. Um, all the efforts that you heard about today can only happen with your support. Um, for the ASAA to succeed, to change FDA policies and influence Phillips, we need your help and we need your contributions. Um, taking on federal agencies and large manufacturers takes money. And there is no one else out there that is speaking for the sleep apnea patients. And there's no one else out there trying to help protect your health and your CPAP equipment um, besides the American Sleep Apnea Association. We are here to help everyone with sleep apnea, no matter where you are in your journey, whether you're the patient, a caregiver, or a parent. And if you could make a donation in any amount will help us continue this fight. $5, $10, $20, doesn't matter what you can do, everything will make a difference. We want you to help us so we can continue helping you. Um, in the chat, we're gonna put links to the donation as well as the snail mail address if you're so inclined to, to send a check. Um, any parting words from Jill's or anyone else on our panel? Uh, sure. Your donation is extremely important, but we also need to have as large as possible a uh, number of uh, uh, ambassadors for the association and for sleep apnea patients. Everyone should remember that you probably have the latest estimation, you have more than 50 million people with sleep apnea in the US, and between 80 and 90% of them don't are not even aware of uh, the condition that they have and we need to have as many sleep apnea patients and supporters really be ambassadors about the association and the profound need to raise awareness about this condition yes yes well, I want to thank everybody here for joining us today, all of our panelists that participated with the FDA and took time out of their busy days again to join us now. Thank you to Gilles Friedman and his staff for all of their work at the uh, ASAA as they continue to help with this recall and with patients um, on their sleep apnea journey. So Jenny Shields, Alice Rowling, Nathan Relkin, Josh Lawton, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, you are the face of sleep apnea today. Thank you very much for giving us your time and your attention. And that's it for today's webinar. Thank just you, in, everyone. Just yeah. in, one second, a uh, very important question that was just asked that need to be answered. Somebody asked, can you please keep us updated? And the answer is, we will keep you updated, but you need to do your part. You need to make sure you're registered as a member of the association. We need to have your email address so we can let you know what are the latest developments. Yes, very important, very important. All right, everybody, I think that's it for this Wednesday evening, afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for your time today. Sleep well, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you.